take um, maybe seven minutes to finish what I didn't finish before. And if I take more than that, somebody stop me. Uh, so just a quick reminder, we're looking at uh, basically trying to understand how um, large fluctuations and cycles are happening in the shipping industry. And we're using basically a very simple dynamic model where all that happens is basically firm entry and exit. So a ship is a firm, there's incumbents and potential entrants, they're deciding uh, if you're in the market, you decide whether to exit and a free entry condition determines how many new ships come in every year. You have to wait a number of years until you actually become an incumbent. And remember, we're going to use basically resale prices as measurements, direct measurements of value functions to estimate um, all the main primitives that we care about. So I left it off here. Um, and I wanted to give you just a brief sense of how estimation uh, goes about. So I'll just, I chose maybe two or three of these steps to show you, um, just so you see um, how things work. And then I'll give you a very, very brief taste of what sort of results, uh, empirical results come out of it. So the first, so there is two steps. The first one does exogenous and equilibrium objects. The second step does the actual model primitives, so entry costs, scrap values, and per period profit functions. So that's a little different than what I was talking about before in BBL, where um, you were taking this as a given and going from there to value functions. So let me say a word about demand, just because I think this is something that's useful overall. So here, demand for shipping services is there is one market demand because it's one global market. And so it's very straightforward in that I am just going to do a standard market level demand estimation. So price for a trip um, on total trips offered or ton miles, think about it as you like. Um, and of course, there are, there are several shifters like uh, world industrial production, steel production, commodity prices, and so on. And so why are we doing this? We really need a state variable that is going to capture the, the demand, the, the, the sort of macro movement. And my original thought, I'll just take world industrial production. Then you look at world industrial production and it's a straight line that goes like this. That's not going to be very helpful in generating fluctuations. But this basically allows you to say, OK, I can really have, uh, I, I can really estimate this demand curve and take its intercept as what is moving every period uh, generating the cycles. Um, and then you can combine a lot of these variables. Commodity prices are going to give you a lot of fluctuations immediately, for instance. And then your state variable is essentially going to be everything in this demand curve other than uh, this part. And then we need the transition for that thing. And for the empirics, this is going to be crucial because this is going to determine agents' expectations. How persistent demand is and how volatile it is is exactly what will determine how, how many people want to enter every period. And I found that basically if you did an AR1, you would never be able to generate crisis in some sense. But if you do an AR1 with actually errors that have a fat tail, you can now, you're now able to essentially generate shocks big enough to, 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 to get uh, the patterns that we actually see in the data. So these are sort of details of the empirical exercise, but I think they kind of showcase the sort of trade-offs that you face when you do this. These are the estimated value functions. So think of this, it's basically average resale prices, if you will. These are just the fitted non-parametric non regression Y hats. And you can see that essentially, indeed, older ships, this is not imposed, older ships have lower values than younger ships. Um, and you also see that you follow the overall pattern that we saw before of the, of the macro movement. Okay. Um, and now I come, I'm going to come straight to the, to the main primitives of interest. And how do we get profits? It's literally, uh, it's literally an, a subtraction because you have something like the value function at hj is the profit at hj. Let's say J is very young, so you cannot exit, because the truth is only after 25 to 30 years old, you're going to exit. So until you hit that age, you don't even have a choice to make. So your problem looks like this. And now I know this. I know this, because I, I, I can compute expectations, and 
this comes from resale prices. So profits are just the difference between the value and the expected value. For the older ships, there's going to be here a maximization over the scrap value and uh, the continuation value. But I'll show you in a second how you estimate the distribution of that. It's very straightforward. And so you can account for that easily. So what do we see here? We see that basically I'm plotting the, the per period payoff of ships for 10 to 20 year olds and 20 plus year old ships. And what you see is something striking, which is related to the log hit situation that we talked about yesterday, which is that most of the time, these ships, at least after 10 years old, they don't make money. They actually lose money or they make money close to zero. So I remember one time I presented this on the market and they told me, you're imposing this, it's a free entry condition. And I said, no, it, this, is com this is coming out of non-parametric estimates. It's not imposed from the free entry condition, but it's exactly sort of what you would expect it to see. Now, why do I say that? First of all, it's roughly close to zero, but it's also negative. And it suggests it's basically the phenomenon of hysteresis. So people have an option value when they decide to exit the market. And you want to exit until you're sure that demand is really bad and it's gonna stay bad. And so you're willing to suffer losses instead of killing this option value. On the other hand, if you happen to be in the market in the periods where demand is high and the supply cannot respond because of time to build and because of convex operating costs, then you're really making uh, high profits. And so you stay in the market um, waiting for these periods where demand is high and supply can't really adjust to the positive shocks. Mm -hmm. How does a single ship operator uh, absorb these losses? Well, again, throughout your lifetime, in principle, I expect you to make as much as you paid to, enter the sh to, en to buy the ship. So if you paid 50 million, I expect you to have yeah. to make 50 million in your lifetime on average. Yeah, but in the meantime, I need to pay salaries and stuff. I already paid for the ship and I'm not making profits. How do I not go under? Yeah, so I mean, um, again, first of all, these are older ships. So in principle, I, I'll tell you in a second why I'm not the young, how the, why the younger ships are essentially, uh, are gonna make more money. Um, but uh, in your, you know, you, I don't know, credit constraints are an issue. And so people might uh, sign long-term contracts in the transportation market to actually get access to credit. Um, but, okay, um, this is one external validation exercise that correlates the estimated profits to um, uh, indices of profits in this industry, and so it tracks things well. Um, and then I skipped the exit, but the exit is fairly straightforward, I, I alluded to it earlier. Um, to get the scrap value, it's, it's very straightforward because to get the scrap value distribution, what's this, you want to, to estimate this distribution. This distribution is nothing other than the probability that the scrap value is smaller than your, think of this as expectation, your expected value. And this is known because it comes from resale prices and computing expected resale prices. And so non-parametrically, you can get this distribution of scrap values. The last part is the entry cost. And this will go back to thinking about um, why the assumptions made on the resale market might not be too unreasonable. So here I am essentially computing the entry costs, which I am computing from the free entry condition. So to compute the, the entry costs, I'm saying entry costs are equal to the value of entering the market, which is the T period ahead expectation of the value of a ship that's zero years old. Okay, and you should expect this to be a very noisy object because it's estimated value function of the youngest ship where you have way fewer observations than for older ships with a T period ahead expectation, right? And I'm comparing it here to the price of a new ship and you can see that these two track fairly well. In fact, you can put them on the same graph, which is uh, in principle, it's even surprising. So this suggests that if, for example, there was severe sample selection in the resale prices, there should be a gap, a substantial gap between these two lines. Okay? Um, so that's the exercise. And then I don't have time to show you graphs and things like that. But then I essentially use the model to explore the nature of, of investment cycles in the market. 
So I look at impulse response function to shocks. So the interesting case here is a positive shock because that's when the supply uh, restrictions are really binding. And what you see is fairly intuitive exposed, following a positive shock, supply response is limited because the ships that are out there are facing capacity constraints. You can't just do infinite trips every period. And entry doesn't react. It's both slower because of time to build and lower because this shock is fading. So it's a mean reverting demand process. The shock hits, it's going to start fading, which means that by the time you enter, the demand is already lower. So fewer people are actually going to enter the market. So we are led to high prices and high profits and lower consumer surplus. And then I look at long run simulations, um, where basically you see that adjustment costs act as smoothers for investment. Precisely because the reaction of entry is lower and slower, the actually adjustment cost will actually tend to smooth out the fluctuations of the market rather than accentuate them. Okay? On the other hand, they lead to cyclical adjustments. So if any of you are familiar with an old literature on hog cycles, which is how farmers are breeding pigs uh, for gestation, and how they looked at how basically herds respond to shocks and how the response to shocks actually happens with oscillations, you get very similar phenomena in this industry. So that's a very brief overview of the, of the types of things you can do with this model. Okay, I was going to talk about one paper on Chinese subsidies and industrial policies to talk about something very um, relevant these days and talk a little bit about dynamics on both demand and supply that Ariel alluded to. If a miracle happens and we have time at the end, I will talk about it. Um, but for now, we're going to move to this. Any questions before I switch topics? OK. Change of subject. OK. So a uh, couple of slides for introduction. So recently, um, there's been a sort of newfound interest, I would say, in transportation very broadly defined. And this new interest has come about because of new technologies, such as uh, Uber, uh, ride-sharing platforms, or self-driving cars that are coming up. Um, important regulation questions, and I think there is a lot that goes there, and it's barely getting started. So whether this has to do with optimal design, like right now Uber is operating almost everywhere and we haven't really thought about regulation, which to me at least seems crazy given all the issues that are related to this type of markets. Infrastructure is a huge deal and there are questions that are coming up very fast about all these new technologies that are going to be important. And then pollution and congestion related to optimal design are also issues that are really big that are people are only starting to, to seriously think about. And the third reason I think that um, there is a new interest in these topics is that we are starting to have really cool data. So you probably have seen the taxi data. Today I'm going to talk about satellite data on ship locations. So all of these issues, you're going to see them in I.O. papers, you're going to see them in trade papers, you're going to see a lot of theory in trade that is looking at infrastructure and optimal design on infrastructure and in development. Um, and all of this is in a series of new papers. So there is already numerous taxi and Uber papers, a lot of them in labor, some, a lot of them in I.O. Um, congestion developing countries, so two of the best development uh, candidates on the market this year looked at congestion, one in Bogota and one in somewhere in India, um, shipping, and then there is some new theory on that Michael Ostrovsky has on, on self-driving cars and how to, how to design the system. So a lot of sort of new stuff coming about. So to give you one example in one slide, but it's a cool paper, so I highly recommend it to you, um, is this one by um, Frechette, Litzeri, and Saltz. Um, and this is a paper that is looking at the New York City yellow cabs. And there is a sister paper by Nick Buholtz that is more tightly linked to the paper that I'm going to talk about afterwards. And so I decided to give you a, a sort of quick preview of this one because it's different. So what do they actually observe? They're going to observe 
the entire market of taxi cabs in New York. This is about 14,000 cabs. And their data is basically going to be every trip that's ever made in New York. They're going to know origin, destination, who the driver was, what, which cab was the relevant one. And their questions are very, fun, you know, very basic. They're going to say there's all sorts of frictions in this market. There are search frictions, and I'll spend a lot of time talking about that for the rest of the, of the lecture. And there's regulatory restrictions. The most important one is basically entry restrictions. So you can't just find a taxi and operate. Uh, there are medallions, and presumably there were reasons for that, um, that the system decided to, to do it. And, of course, prices are regulated. So you have a very specific tariff structure that you have to pay. And their question was, what is the impact of these types of frictions? In this paper, they will focus more on search and on, on entry restrictions. Okay? So what they're going to do is they're going to write down a general equilibrium model. Okay? Um, the model is going to have a demand side and a supply side. And the big challenge for them, which we're going to talk quite a bit about in my paper as well, is that demand is not observed. Why? Because you see all the trips that happened, but you don't know who was actually searching for a cab. So for all we know, there were double passengers hailing for a cab that didn't get one. So they will actually have to bypass this. And to do this, they will actually write a micro simulation of New York. So they will create a model of New York City where they will take seriously the structure of the blocks that are wider, uh, uh, you know, in the, north, uh, in the north part and narrower in the south part. And they will, you know, look at taxi drivers that randomly turn on different nodes and randomly meet a passenger. And through this micro model, they will essentially invert this matching process to figure out how many people must have been waiting at each intersection. Okay? That's how they will estimate demand. And the supply side is a little labory. So they are going to think about the decisions of drivers to, to start a shift and to stop uh, and go home and uh, you know, relax. Um, so that's demand, that's supply. And I already talked about this. Essentially, the output of the model is basically waiting time, search time, and taxi revenue. And once they have the model, they will do counterfactuals like, what if we cut uh, medallions to half? What if half the market becomes Uber, so there are no search frictions? What if the whole market becomes Uber, so that there are no search frictions? And quantify how much these different frictions matter uh, for welfare. Okay. So that's a, a sort of very, very brief um, summary of that paper. For the rest of the time, we're going to talk about ships again, rather than taxis. And we're gonna, I'm going to um, talk about this paper here. So what do we do in this paper? So I already sort of, we already talked about shipping and the industry is exactly the same as what I was just talking about, so we can do this fast. But overall, about 80% of global trade by volume is carried out by ships. And this already suggests that if you're interested in world trade, understanding how the transportation sector uh, behaves and what its market structure is, it's important to actually understand the trade costs that countries face and the resulting trade flows between countries. Okay? So I want to start with two facts about the market that are sort of uh, striking. The first is that there are large price differentials across space. So if you want to ship something from China to Australia, it's going to cost you around $7,000 a day. But if you want to do the reverse trip from Australia to China, it's substantially more expensive at about $10,000 a day. So what's the story here? As I was saying before, China has been growing dramatically. And in the types of goods that we are looking at, which is raw materials, this means that China is importing a lot. So China is importing all these raw materials to build streets, factories, infrastructure, and so on. And so a typical trip in the bulk uh, shipping data is to take iron ore or coal from Australia, who is very rich in these types of goods, to China. So if you're a ship and you end your trip in Australia, you're very happy because you know that there are a lot of cargoes for you to pick up there. But if you're a ship that ends your trip, trip in China, China is a big net importer. It doesn't export much in these goods. And so you know you're going to be stuck there. Just like a taxi cab that is you know, forced to go from Manhattan to, to Queens, 
and you know that there it's very sparse and you're not going to uh, have an easy time finding another passenger. So what you do is you command a much higher price to end your trip in China than to end your trip in Australia. Okay? So this is the first fact. The second fact is that if you went out in the ocean and you looked at all the ships that are traveling, you would see that actually about 45% of the ships that are sailing are actually sailing empty. Okay? And I'm going to use the word ballast, which is what practitioners use for this sort of empty traveling. And 45%, you know, a lot of it makes sense because of this natural asymmetry. China is not rich in iron ore. Um, Australia is very rich in iron ore. So, of course, there is going to be empty traveling. But 45% is high. Um, and you're going to start wondering whether there are, is also something inefficient going on here. So what we do in this paper is basically build uh, a laboratory model um, that is going to model the behavior of both exporters and transportation agents. Okay? And the spatial equilibrium of this model is basically going to determine the trade costs that different countries are facing and the resulting trade flows. Okay? And the goal is going to be to showcase, um, for this crowd, this is going to be obvious, but we want to showcase that basically trade costs are endogenous and they're determined jointly with trade flow. So they're equilibrium prices in a market. Um, so, in a, you know, it sounds obvious to us in, a, in sort of standard trade models, trade costs are these iceberg costs that are exogenous and they fall from the sky. In principle, they say, you know, we have the trade costs, they lead to trade flows, but in principle there is an arrow going in the other direction as well. And this is going to have consequences that we're going to talk about. The most important consequence is going to be that basically there are network effects. And so the whole network of countries is going to matter rather than just bilateral distances between trading partners. Okay? And the second main point of the paper is that search frictions between exporters and ships can actually limit um, the trade flows that we see. Okay? And actually we are going to think I'll spend some time talking about um, how to think about uh, the existence of search frictions. So in the taxi papers, um, people usually say, you know, yes, there are search frictions, but remember that we don't observe demand. So we are not going to be able to know if uh, a particular, we won't know if a, if a taxi was in a particular neighborhood and it didn't find anybody. We won't know if somebody was there and they didn't meet, or if actually nobody was there, okay? Suggesting that actually it's not entirely straightforward to measure the extent of search frictions. So we're going to think about that a little bit. Of course, but you could measure efficiency, no? You could see whether taxis had people at all in the, in the car for most of the trips, right? Like for most of the, the, the cab was driving, for example. Yeah, so actually it's a good point. Um, what the, the argument they make to say that there are search frictions is this type of fact. They say taxi cabs are waiting for a long time. But they don't know this. They only know the actual trips, right? So if you see a five-hour gap, you don't know what was happening in that gap. You don't know if people were there and I didn't meet them or if nobody was there because one side is unobserved. And I'll talk about this in, in, in a fair amount of detail. Okay, so the data we're going to use is always kind of fun to talk about. So we're going to have information on bilateral shipping contracts. So I'm going to know how much you paid to ship your grain from port A to port B. And then a data set of global vessel movements. And then we're going to use the machinery of uh, dynamic games that we've been talking about. We're basically going to write down a very simple dynamic spatial search model. And we're going to go after two main sets of primitives. The first one is something we haven't been talking about, and it's specific to this type of applications. And it's the matching process between exporters and ships. And for us, this is going to mean estimating the matching function and the potential exporters. So just like in taxicabs, you need both the matching function and the hailing passengers, not just one of the two. And then these are standard primitives, just like the ones we've been talking about. So the ship costs, um, the exporter valuations, and their entry costs into exporting. Okay. 
And then at the very end, I'm going to close with counterfactuals. So I'm going to show you four counterfactuals. We're going to do a trade elasticity uh, with respect to fuel costs or shipping efficiency. And we're going to ask how much, how sensitive international trade is to uh, this parameter. And the sort of new feature of this elasticity is going to be the fact that the transportation sector is in equilibrium and so it reacts to the change as well. Then we're going to look at how shocks propagate and I'm going to do, um, I'm going to ask what happens if China uh, slows down. And here we're going to see basically that there are import and export complementarities. So think about it like this. Suppose that China slows down. In our case, this means lower imports. Okay. All these ships were going to China and ending their trip there. And they were stuck there because China wasn't exporting much, which means that if you were an exporter in China, it was cheap for you to hire this ship. And now this no longer happens. So prices will go up in China. Chinese exporters will be worse off and exports are going to fall along with the imports. And then we're going to see how this has domino effects through the whole world through the shipping price. Give me half a second. Then we're going to do infrastructure. So we're going to ask what would happen if we were to open the Northwest Passage, which is the Arctic route that would bring closer the Far East to the US. And finally, we're going to measure the, the sort of trade lost because of search frictions. Sure. That's going to be part of the equilibrium. It's a counterfactual. Okay. And the second one, the opening of the passage, what, what is the, the assumption that you make when the passage is not there about the rest of the world near the passage? Well, the, the, what's, it's too soon to get into this in detail, but uh, the, Northwest pa the, the counterfactual is basically going to change the costs of certain origins and destinations. That's what's going to happen. Of course, the economic activity is going to change endogenously. That's going to be the outcome of my model, what happens to world trade. Okay. You can ask me again later. It's too soon to, to go into this. OK. OK. So what I'll do is talk a little bit about the industry data, fa go through some facts, model, estimation, and then give you the counterfactual. So we already talked about bulk shipping. It's exactly the same environment that we saw before. Again, think of these guys exactly like taxi drivers. They meet an exporter, they take their cargo from point A to B, and then they will go on to meet someone else. Contracts happen through brokers, and um, the market is extremely decentralized. Um, you might have one broker or multiple brokers. It's an unconcentrated industry, homogeneous good. I think pretty much everything on this slide we've already discussed. Okay. So what's the data? The data is going to involve, first of all, a data set on contracts. So here we are essentially going to know, this is like the taxi trips. So we are going to know um, how much you paid per day for a particular origin to a particular destination, as well as when was the signing date and the loading date, okay? And who the ship was, who the exporter was. The second data set is going to be a data set of ship movements. We're going to know this for about 5,000 ships. This is half the world fleet. And what the satellite data is going to give us is the exact location of every one of these ships for every five minutes. And the cool thing is that the data also has this variable called draft, which is essentially the vertical distance between the water line and the bottom of the ship. So basically, at any point in time, you know if the ship is loaded or not. I'm sorry, one more again. No. So container so container shipping is a completely different seg <coughs> completely different segment of shipping where you would have boxes basically. That's what you're asking, right? Um, and you can't really put iPhones in these ships and you can't put iron ore in container ships, really. So it's it's uh, it's a completely different technology. Okay, and finally, we're going to collect some weather data uh, that are going to give us basically the wind speed at sea. 
and you're going to see where this is going to become useful. So this is a snapshot of the data. Uh, it's basically 10 days in our data set of all the, all the messages that we're getting from the ships. And you can see how, sen for example, how central China is. So you can see that China, that there are a lot of routes leading to China, Australia to China, which is the example I gave before. Brazil to China is another big trade. And then the, the Northwest uh, is also another uh, region that is exporting a lot to China. Okay. So what I want to do is um, go through three, just three facts. Uh, I want to say one thing about trade flows, one thing about trade costs, and then something about search frictions. And we'll go deeper into search frictions later on. So let me start with trade flows. So in this graph, what we're seeing is that basically most countries in the world are either big net importers or big net exporters. Okay? So um, Australia, Brazil, North America are the world's biggest exporters. India and China are the world's biggest importers. Again, these are the, develop the sort of countries that are developing and requiring this sort of materials and are getting them from the purple countries. This fact, which is that trade is very imbalanced, okay, is going to have an important impact on the trade costs that different regions are facing. Okay. And to look at that, we're basically running some very simple regressions um, of uh, prices, shipping prices, on some characteristics. So what we're doing here is simply regressing um, shipping prices on the ship size. These are the different categories of ships. Okay? And just to tell you the things I, wanna, I want you to take away from this, in the first couple of columns, all we're doing is controlling for origin and destination. And you see that essentially, once you do that, you can explain for about 65% of price variation and the destination matters, so the R square goes up a little bit. Um, that's not necessarily surprising. Origin, of course, is going to matter. Conditions, products, competition, they're going to determine prices. Destination is a little bit more interesting, but not something very surprising. In column three is the main thing to note, which is that we are adding two specific variables to capture the the asymmetry of trade. Okay? So we're basically adding the following. So suppose that you go are going from point A to point B. Okay? Once you reach B, what is the probability that after B, you're going to have to go somewhere ballast? And how, far, how much ballasting do you tend to do? How many miles on average? Okay? So for example, in China, you know that you're likely going to ballast and perhaps very far. And you see that both of these variables are, are significant and they're economically big and they tend to increase prices. So you will ask for more money to reach a bad destination. In the last column, we are going to add the product that was carried. We know this for very few contracts. And I'm going to say this now and explain it later. What we see is that basically the more expensive the product that is shipped, okay, the higher the price that you pay to ship it, which, which is sort of interesting. It's not something that you can instantly uh, explain. OK. The third thing is about search frictions. Okay. And I already uh, foreshadowed that we are going to think about how to measure search frictions, unlike the taxi literature. And to do that, we are basically going to follow um, the labor literature. Okay, so in labor, the vast majority of the literature is focusing on frictional markets. Okay? And the facts that they point to to argue that there are search frictions in the labor market are two. First, they say, look, there is wage dispersion. So observationally, similar workers are getting different wages. And second, there is a coexistence of unemployed workers and vacancies. Okay? So we see at the same time a guy looking for a job and a job being open. Hence, they're not meeting and, and there is a friction in this market. Okay? So what we're going to try and do here is essentially replicate these two facts. All right? The first one is easy, and I actually already showed it to you. With, there is substantial price dispersion in shipping prices given a time, origin, and destination triplet. So I'm saying I showed it to you because in the price regressions that we saw, you can explain about 70, up to 70% 70 
of price variation. Okay? If you take a specific time origin destination triplet, the coefficient of variation is about 30%, which is pretty high. So it's like a rental car. So you're, get, you're paying a price per day um, to, for a trip from Australia to China for iron ore. Okay? Sure. So I'm controlling for origin and destination. Yeah. Right? Yeah, I'm controlling for origin and destination fixed effects. So it's all there, right? Interaction is hard. So you can do distance. Um, I, I'm not sure what would be, what would be important beyond uh, the individual fixed effects, to be honest. But you can look at, a sp so for example, we've looked at um, pairs where you have a lot of uh, contracts. So like Australia, China, we have lots of data. And you still see exactly the same patterns. Now, in addition to the price dispersion, I showed you that the price depends on the value of the good. And I promised to explain it. I'll explain it a little later. But this is actually consistent with a, fric with a model of frictions. Okay? It says the, lo the law of one price basically doesn't hold. And we'll see later on that it's, it's very much consistent with a bargaining model. Okay? The second fact is the coexistence of unemployed workers and vacancies. And in labor, it's although we could debate that, um, they're lucky because they see unemployed workers, they see vacancies, they see employment, okay, so they're done. They can basically see whether you have the coexistence of these two. But we don't. We only see the realized trips and we see ships that are searching. We don't know who, what exporters are out there looking to find a ship. So what we're going to do is basically look for evidence of unrealized matches. Okay? And we're going to do this in two ways. I'm going to mention the two ways now. I'm going to talk about one of them. And then I'm going to come back to the second one a little later because it's, it's much easier to understand once you've seen the model. Okay? Mm -hmm. Again? Yeah, so... In, so all of these costs are actually paid by the exporter. Okay. Yeah. So and they're not in my prices. Doesn't that, shouldn't I charge a higher price if I'm yeah, yeah, so in equilibrium, they will be reflected. But uh, for example, insurance costs are not in my numbers, is what I meant. Okay. okay, so we're going to do two things. The first one is we're going to basically derive a test for whether matches okay, are smaller than the minimum between ships and exporters. So suppose you, ha you are in a port and you have 100, 100 exporters and 150 ships. If the market is frictionless, you should see 100 matches. If you see 80 matches, it means that 20 potential matches were not realized. If you observed all three, it's straightforward to run this test. You can, you can just ask whether the inequality holds. We don't see this, so we're going to have to think about how to test for this. Okay? I'll come back to this a little bit later. The second thing we document as evidence of unrealized matches, and we're going to see that now, is that there are simultaneous arrivals and departures of empty ships. So what do I mean by that? So let's look at this graph um, that is going to plot two countries that are both net exporters, okay? So let me start with Norway. So what we see in this graph is basically the, the yellow line is the number of ships that are arriving empty in Norway and loading in Norway, okay? So I come in empty, I find a cargo, I leave. And the purple line is the number of ships that are leaving empty from Norway. So what you see here is exactly what you should expect to see in a net exporter. There is a lot of ships come in empty from somewhere. They load, they leave, and there's virtually nobody that leaves without a cargo. Okay? Same thing for Chile, and you see that you have simultaneously ships that arrive empty, load, and ships that are leaving empty. And this is weird, 
Why? Because it means that in this particular week, there was a cargo in Chile, somebody came empty, picked it up, and in the same week, a ship that was in Chile left empty from Chile. And the question is, why didn't this ship that was empty in Chile not pick up this cargo and we brought somebody else empty to pick it up? Okay? <laughs> Search frictions. <laughs> we can control for, I'll show you in a second, we can control. Search frictions. So it can be a number of things. Um, Sorry? Yeah. Sure, I can control for ship type, and the same thing is going to happen. So what can be inside the frictions? So it can be information. We think it, so we have three or four stories that we, that we think are relevant. Um, information. So somehow the brokers did not meet. These brokers are getting something like 5,000 emails in a day, and it could be that information gets lost. Um, it can be um, asymmetric information that uh, of long-run relations, like I don't know you, I'm not sure I want to contract with you. I think this is probably secondary, but it could happen. Uh, infrastructure, so port congestion, um, and things like that. Um, regulations, so some flags, uh, Israel actually has some restrictions in flags. Um, um, and these we think are sort of the main, the main stories that are behind it. I think the bigger ones are information and, uh, and ports, actually, that would explain it. But we are going to be quiet. So we are going to have, you'll see in a second, but we're going to, we're, for us, frictions is going to mean that matches are lower than the minimum of the two sides. That's all we're going to do in this paper. OK, is Chile special? No. So here we are plotting the ratio of these two lines for all countries in the world. And you see that for net exporters, it should be close to 0. But actually, for several countries, this is not the case. Since you asked and you know what Panamax are, I cannot resist but show this to you. So this is by port, and uh, I don't know where my legend is, and by ship type, so Panamax, Handymax, Handy Size, Cape Size. And basically what you see, we do, you don't see it because I don't have the legend, but basically for bigger ship types, uh, you have a lot more mass close to zero. And that makes sense because for the biggest ships, you have fewer ships, fewer exporters. They go to fewer ports. And this phenomenon is way less pronounced. The purple ones are the small guys that go everywhere. And there, the problem is much more pronounced. Uh, another story could be reputation. So long run, re long run relations. Yeah, so my prior, my strong prior, <laughs> is that ship heterogeneity is very limited. The things we can do overall is to see that they go to all regions, carry all products. Um, you talk to these guys, they will tell you, I contracted with 300 people in my lifetime. But it could, OK? And if it's based on asymmetric information type phenomena, then it's, a, it's literally a friction. If it's pure heterogeneity, then it's more up for discussion. But I don't think taste heterogeneity is really a, because for it, there is no Uber for ships. I'll talk about that at the very end. OK, so what's the model? So it's going to be a simple, dynamic, spatial search model. Um, and it's going to work like this. We're going to split the world into I regions. And geography is going to be captured by different trip durations between regions. And there's going to be two types of agents, exporters or freights. I will use both words, and then the ships. Okay? So let me start setting out the environment. So in each region I, we're going to say that there are FI freights that are waiting for transportation. And these freights are going to be heterogeneous in two dimensions. The value of delivery, V, so this is the money I'm going to make when I sell my iron ore to the Chinese producer, and their destination J, at the end of the model, I will endogenize the destination. They will actually choose it. 
Ships are homogeneous, they can carry at most one freight. And in every period, I'll bring it down, a ship is either, um, a ship is either sailing or it is waiting in a port. If the ship is sailing towards some destination, it is paying a cost that I'm going to call C of sailing. So think of this as primarily fuel costs. Okay? And uh, what's going to happen is that a ship that is traveling from I to J will arrive probabilistically with some probability Cij. So this is, it sounds weird at first, but it's a very simple tractability trick that says that on average, the trip duration is 1 over C. And since Ariel talked about the curse of dimensionality and all these type of phenomena, basically we could totally say that trip durations are um, fixed. What would happen is you would need to keep track for every destination how many ships are one period from arrival, two periods from arrival, three periods from arrival, four periods of arrival. We're going to look at steady states in the end. So this assumption actually is not really, is not really, it shouldn't really be hurtful. Okay. If the ship is not sailing, it is waiting at a port, and it is paying a cost CU, U from unemployment. Um, and when it's in a port and it wakes up, it's going to first randomly match with an exporter, and I'll give you all the details in the next slide. And if it finds a match, great. It will match, it will agree on, uh, on taking the cargo to the exporter's destination and start its trip to that destination. If it doesn't find a match, this is when the ship actually has to make a choice and the ship will decide where to search. So it will either wait at port and try its luck tomorrow or it will start ballasting going empty to some other port to start searching there. Yes, and we can observe that. So the draft, the variable, the distance between the water and the bottom of the ship, the distribution is by model. So the ships are literally either full or empty, which is consistent with the narratives from uh, industry people. Okay, what's the matching process? Like I said, it's going to be very, very simple. So I should have mentioned this already. One, give me half a second. Um, it's a Mortensen Pissaridis style model. So it's very much a labor search model for those of you who are familiar with it. So the matching is going to be fairly simple. I think it's very interesting to go into the matching process, but we're not doing this here. So random search, exporters and ships are going to search for each other. And there's going to be a matching function that is going to tell us, given a number of freights and a number of ships, how many matches are actually going to happen. Okay, so S are the unmatched ships, F are the unmatched freights. The matching function is also going to give us the probabilities of finding a match. So if you are a ship, your probability is just this M over S. And if you're afraid, it's just M over the freights. So if there are 50, if there are 100, uh, 100 uh, exporters and 200 ships, the probability of finding uh, an exporter is a half. And the probability for an exporter of finding a ship, um, uh, well, it, it's determined by the matching function. So you're allowing the matching function itself to vary by location? Yes. It's region specific. Um, Search frictions generate rents to be split. So search friction means that masses are possibly lower than the minimum of the two sites. And the price for going from origin I to destination J when the exporter you met has valuation V is going to be determined by Nash bargaining. Martin? So when you said you were going to focus on the steady state, is that implying that you're going to focus on the, the fact that times are going to be constant? It's going to mean that I'm going to look at um, the steady state of the distribution of ships and freights over space. I'll come to it. OK. So I'll give you the timing, and then I'm going to go into the Bellman equations. And I think the Bellman equations show pretty clearly what happens in the model. So in every time period, in every region, First, there is a matching phase, so ships and freights match according to the matching function. If you, uh, uh, okay, so, uh, then ships that were unmatched are going to draw some logit preference shocks and they will decide whether to stay where they are and wait for an exporter or to ballast somewhere else and they will choose their destination. Then, sort of states transitions are implemented. So ships that are traveling arrive with some probability. 
unmatched ships that decided to ballast begin their travels, and I'm going to need a death rate for exporters. So with some, think of this as very, very small, but with some tiny probability if you're an exporter, you're going to die. This is going to guarantee existence. Finally, and I haven't talked about this yet, potential exporters are going to choose whether and where to export, and if they choose to export, what their destination is going to be. Okay, so now let me talk potential about... Right? Yes. Yeah. So now let me show the value functions. So let me start with a traveling ship. So a traveling ship... Maybe I will, no. So I'm going to call the traveler, uh, the traveler's uh, value function W. So if you're traveling from I to J, you're going to pay the sailing cost with probability C I J. You're going to arrive at J and you're going to start unmatched at J. So you're going to get the value of being unmatched at J, which I'm going to show you in a second. With probability 1 minus C, you're not going to arrive at your destination and you're going, go, you're going to be a traveler again tomorrow. Okay. What happens when you wake up unmatched in a region? So this is this U. This is the value of essentially reaching your destination and starting there tomorrow. So this value U of being in market I is the following. You're going to pay a port cost right? with probability lambda, which is given by the matching function. You're going to meet someone. And you're going to get the value of being matched, and I'll show it in a second. At the start of the period, you don't know who you're meeting. So you have to take expectation over the destination and the valuation of the guy you're going to meet. And with probability 1 minus lambda, you're not going to meet anyone, and you will get the value of being unemployed, which you'll see. What happens if you meet someone? This is simple. If I meet someone, that wants to go from I to J and has valuation V. We're going to agree on a price that we'll derive in a couple of slides. And then I'm going to start traveling. I will pay the sailing cost. I will travel for 1 over C periods on average. 1 over C periods later, I will arrive at J and I will restart there. With some probability, I will match there and so on and so forth. Okay? If I don't find a match, that's when I need to make my choice. It's going to be a dynamic, discrete choice of the Rust variety that we talked about before. And my choice is the following. I either stick around in this, in this region I, and so tomorrow I pay the port cost again, some probability I meet someone, and so on. Or I can choose to go to some other place. And if I decide to go to some other place, I have to travel, pay the sailing cost, arrive one over C periods later, and, ma and start, restart in that destination one over C periods later. Does that make sense? And the traveling is without is ballast. The value is always without the ballast? Um, traveling can be either full or empty. So, uh, uh, no, so basically I'm saying it, it turns out it doesn't matter, and I'll tell you why, but. Um, I am assuming that the sailing cost is the same if you're empty or, or not. Yeah. And the reason is that the prices, the fuel costs are paid by the exporter, and I'm adding them to the price. So this actually generates the asymmetry. Okay, exporters. Exporters are fairly simple. So this is the value function of an exporter, a freight, that wants to go from origin I to destination J and has valuation V. With some probability, lambda f, given by the matching function, he's going to find a ship. Great. In that case, he's going to get his valuation and pay the price. With probability 1 minus lambda, he doesn't meet anyone, and he just waits. So if you're an exporter, you just basically wait until you find a ship, in which case you get your valuation, pay the price. Um, and uh, if not, you just uh, keep, keep waiting. Yes, <laughs> we, are, we are assuming that basically matches, that basically a meeting always becomes a match, which amounts to assuming that valuations of exporters are sufficiently high. We can test for this empirically, actually. We can, test, we can look at the surplus 
exposed, and it's always very far from zero. Yes, but it's never close to z it's a it's a loose point. It's a loose argument, but it's at least it's never close to being zero. Um, the reason I think so basically the transportation price is about eight percent of the value of these goods, which is fairly low. Um, and it's a period so for the ships it's a period of as we saw before it's a period it's a very bad time for ships, so it's still the crisis they haven't recovered their begging to find uh, an exporter, basically. So I'm not worried about that side of the market. Um, for exporters, our argument is basically that these guys are, are much smaller than their valuations. But it's an assumption. It's an assumption for counterfactuals, by the way. That's where it really bites, because we're not going to change the matching function in counterfactuals. Why no. is there such a problem? It's actually done on Skype. Um, <laughs> it's interesting. So we actually presented this seminar at the Insti Royal Institute for Chartered Shipbrokers of Canada. And there was a heated discussion about whether there is ever going to be an Uber for ships. They actually argued between them. So right now, this is not, they are not using sort of any program. They are literally talking to each other over Skype or, or Hotmail or Yahoo. And um, <laughs> the so it's it's just some Did people have what were the arguments why there yeah. couldn't be a well they say things like the human factor is always necessary is always ne it's it's not you could say the same thing for taxis i agree so uh, some guys some say that you can't have an uber i agree so the, the youngest people that were there were saying look this is going to happen but so far people have tried and it has failed actually but it has not happened I mean, my, <laughs> my guess is it's not in the interest of the people who are currently in the industry, and that there's a question of whether there's a new entrance. Mm -hmm. my, my model-based answer is that if you're a ship, you would never want to participate in this platform right now, because basically the only way for you to make money is because of frictions. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> otherwise you would just bid each other. You're the long side, so you would just bid each other down. Um, which is consistent with them not revealing the location before satellite times and so on. But anyway, it's an interesting discussion. OK, uh, matching um, prices. So it's, it's going to be Nash bargaining. So we meet. Um, there is a surplus to be split, standard surplus sharing condition. I'm just going to go straight to what the price looks like because, go ahead. No. No, so think of this as short run time to build okay. total supplies fixed. A firm is a ship just like the previous paper. So small and concentrated, small firms and concentrated market. That's the assumption. No. no. OK, so let me show you the, the, the sort of one of the two basic outputs of the model. That's the price to go from origin i to destination j when valuation is v. Ignore these ratios that look a little ugly. What this basically says is that the price is going to depend on the valuation of the freight and the ship value functions, the traveler value function, and the ship's outside option. So why is this an interesting formula? First of all, the fact that the price depends on the valuation brings us back to the price regressions, where we saw that the type of good you're shipping um, matters for the price you end up paying. And now we can explain it. So a bargaining model is actually going to deliver this result. And you know, if you didn't have frictions, just for the record, if you didn't have frictions, the prices would essentially lose the first part. And what would happen is, suppose you have 100 ships and 50 exporters, the 50 ships would get matched, and they would pay essentially the marginal cost. The marginal cost is going to include the outside option of these ships. So you would essentially bid them down to their, to, their, to, their out, to their outside option. This also is saying that the price depends on distance. It depends on conditions at the destination and travel costs through this W 
uh, value functions. And conditions of the destination is a very rich object because it means how many freights are in this destination, what are the valuations, how central is this other location, is it close to other things, what are the matching probabilities there, um, what's the entire geography of this destination. So it's something that is, has a lot of different elements into it. And of course, price depends on all countries, not just IJ as in a typical trade model. Okay. Um, well, it's, it's, I, I've already sort of uh, included it in the price. So it's, I, I've just rescaled my prices, essentially. Okay. Final stage of the model is the choice of exporters of where to export. So we're going, this is going to be super simple, and we're now working on doing a sort of real trade model on top of this, but here it goes. So there's going to be epsilon i exante homogeneous potential exporters who are going to choose whether and where to export. And this is the IO side <laughs> of us saying simply, simple discrete choice. If you are an exporter, you're either going to not export and get nothing, okay, or you're going to choose where to export. What's going to happen to you? Sorry for the overload of notation. This is basically simply the thing we saw before. So it's simply... Ooh. So it's simply this. It's simply the value that an existing exporter gets, which is simply at some point I'm going to get my valuation minus my price. At what point? It depends how fast I'm going to find a ship. Okay? So once I enter, I just wait until I find a ship. That's what this is. I'm going to pay an entry cost. So think of this as other trade costs other than the transport price. So finding a partner, uh, producing the good, and so on and so forth. And that's that. That's simply, that's very simple, simply the discrete choice the that the export is. You have a discrete choice, so there's got to be one normalization. Oh, yeah, here, this is zero. That's just a normalization. Yeah. You can put anything yeah. Okay, so that's the model. You have these I regions. In each region, there are S ships, F rates. They wake up, they match. The matching function tells us how many matches are going to happen. If you found a match, great, you start traveling to the destination of your partner, restart there. If you don't find a match, you choose whether to wait or where to travel. If you travel, you restart wherever you, you decide to go. And you're assuming a steady state. And I am assuming a steady state. Is that a good assumption? Mm -hmm. Presumably you can. <laughs> <laughs> That's a big discussion. So at the start of the project, I didn't expect we would stay there, but in the end, this was already giving us a lot of interesting things. I think the main assumption here is that these are weekly choices that these ship owners are making, and our assumption is that they behave as if within the next, within this short run, the distribution of ships and exporters is, is constant. So we're going to think of macro shocks as basically taking us to a new steady state and transitions being very fast, which I think is okay because most trips are with about two weeks. So I would expect that if I'm hit, if I if I go to a new steady state, it should happen fast. But the shocks um, in a new state in two weeks is going to matter. So if there's, I mean, say there's a set of shocks to go to the various destinations. So where I am in two weeks is going to matter, which means, you know, it's not stationary. Uh, but what do you mean the shocks in each destination? Well, I don't know. What do you mean by things? What, what does change over time? Let's ask that. Well, well in that's principle, you would have, the, you would have the, um, the, the, the movements. In principle, you need to think about the number of ships in each region and the number of traveling ships and the number of exporters in each that's region. The that's the state. Right, so we and that is, we're not letting that change. I yeah, think that's that really change. interesting. The question is how much does it change in within a week? We're not doing it. <laughs> I don't know how to do it actually. Um, okay, so what do we want to estimate? And I will do the first part in det some detail and the rest very fast. We want to estimate the matching function and freights, the travel costs and the port costs, the Vs, the, d the distribution of freight valuations, and the CAPAs, the production and export costs. 
what's our data, number of ships and number of matches, prices, ballast choices, so these are CCPs, and trade flows. Okay? So I'm going to talk about this part because this is sort of different, and then I'm going to tell you that the rest sort of comes from what we talked about this morning, but I'll give you a sense. So let me talk about matching functions. So matching function estimation, for those of you that have done a bit of labor, and I know there's a few of you in the audience, um, it's done throughout, it's, it's sort of a common thing to do in labor. And in labor markets, they observe workers that are unemployed, vacancies and matches, so they were just going to estimate the matching function straight up. In taxi cabs, they see taxis, they see matches, they don't see the passengers, so they have a similar problem to what we have. But what we want to do, what we want, the way we sort of want to extend things is, two di is sort of two dimensions. The first is that, as I already was talking about, all of this literature take a stance on whether there are frictions or not, and we think it's not that obvious. The second is that it imposes strong functional form assumptions. And you might think, we don't, we don't care about nonparametrics, but actually when it comes to matching function, it could really matter because you're really going to buy your welfare implications if you assume something specific about the matching function. Okay. So let me just talk about the first one, which is the presence of search frictions, which is something I promised when we talked about incoming outgoing ships. So what happens if there are no search frictions? Basically, matches are the minimum between ships and freights. Okay. What happens if there are search frictions? Matches will be given by this matching function and they're potentially smaller than the minimum between ships and freights. The problem is how do you distinguish these two cases if you actually don't see one side of the market? And I would argue that this is relevant in labor as well because you don't know search intensities and things like that. So it, it's actually not as straightforward. So what we do is I'm first going to give you a test, uh, as I was saying before, for this inequality. And then I'm going to give you a structural approach to get the matching function. Okay? So the test is very simple. Right? And it's this. So suppose that in some markets, you knew that the minimum between ships and freights is the freights. And actually, I, ex I expect this to be the case in all my markets, because as I said, there is massive ship oversupply and crisis. <coughs> so I expect basically fewer exporters than ships in all markets. Then what? If there are no frictions, so that matches are the minimum between ships and freights, then if you were to change ships, you would not affect matches. So suppose you had uh, 150 ships and 100 freights. Um, if there are no frictions, you should always see 100 freights, regardless of how many ships you have. But if you have frictions and you were changing exogenously the number of ships, you might actually see matches moving. Okay? And so what we're going to do is basically use unpredictable weather shocks. So high wind or too high wind or too low wind, unpredictably, to shock the arrival of ships in different markets and see whether matches are affected. And what we see is that basically in all our markets, matches react to these shocks. I shouldn't have used the too high or too low. It's just unpredictable because it's very complicated because if you take Australia, there is wind in all directions and some ports are hurt. Some so it's just unpredictable weather situations, weather shocks. It does affect, they don't just go around weather or kind of go through. They have to choose a destination. Well, I, my only point here, the only thing that's really going to happen here, because I'm discretizing at the weekly level anyway, is that some ships' arrival will switch weeks okay. and that this will tend to affect matches. Okay. So basically, for all our markets, we can reject that we are in a frictionless situation. What if S becomes? I mean, it never becomes zero. It's in the order of hundreds. Sure. <laughs> OK. OK, now what about the estimation of the matching function itself? So here, we're going to basically use um, a well-known literature on nonparametric identification. If you don't know this work, it's, it's sort of interesting and useful. It goes back to Matskin 2003. And in a more standard metrics notation, just to make it simpler, the problem is that you have some output that is a nonlinear function of some x and some epsilon. And you want to get both the function m and epsilon. Okay? 
And what do you need to do this? You need that m is increasing in epsilon. For us, this is fine, because the more freights you have, the more masses you're going to get, all else equal. You're going to need some restriction on m to differentiate monotonic transformations of these two. You can do several things. We are going to use a homogeneity of degree 1 assumption. And finally, you're going to need either independence of these two. That's a very bad idea, because ships and freights are determined in equilibrium, or an instrument. And this is where the weather is going to come in again. So let me, I, I actually had hoped I would have the time to go through the details, but I don't. So I'm just going to try and give you the intuition for how this works. And it's all, it's all in there. Um, so basically, the problem for us is matches is a function of ships and freights. And we want to get both the matching function and the number of freights in each region, okay, in each time period and each region. So we observe M. And we observe S, X and Y. Okay? The correlation between the matches and the ships is basically going to inform us about the derivative of the matching function with respect to S. So if ships move a lot and matches move a lot, uh, versus a situation where ships move a lot and matches move very little, okay, that's the type of information that is going to give us this derivative. I should have said conditional on these two being independent. So I'm going to give you intuition if these two things are independent. So I'm going to get this derivative. And then if I assume homogeneity of degree 1, I am instantly getting the other derivative of the matching function with respect to freights. So now I know the matching function. Once I know the matching function, I can invert it to get the freights. Okay? I always need to get one of the two. Then I can invert to get the other one. Now, this relies on independence, this intuition. Um, but the instrument and this is not entirely obvious, I would have to show you the details, but the instrument is going to let me clean it up, basically. No, 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 I will use the instrument to basically, because the instrument will say something like, do this with ships on weather, like a first stage, and now, con and now I'm going to assume conditional independence of freights on the residual of that first stage, and then I can condition on... That's too fast. It's, if it's, it's worth sort of uh, looking at. That's a very good question. Yes. I agree. So we actually have a version. It turns out you don't need this. And I completely agree, because especially for welf welfare, yeah. this could be important. So it turns out that. You don't need, you, instead, you are going to need some restriction. You cannot be completely unrestricted. So instead of this, you can make an assumption on the distribution of freights. So we did it with Poisson, Poisson, Poisson freights, which is a very reasonable distribution of assumptions. And it's very, it's we actually were impressed. It's surprisingly similar, and you get constant returns to scale. So it, maybe in the next version of the paper, the Poisson will be our baseline. I don't know. Um, OK. Very briefly, estimated freights over space, big exporters, ex uh, Australia, Indonesia, North America. So this passes the eye test, right? Um, estimated search frictions. This again sort of passes. So this is basically the difference between the minimum of ships and freights and the matches. So it's, if you have 100 uh, exporters and 150 ships, and instead of 100 matches, you have 80, you lose this 20. This is the percentage of matches that you lost. And again, this sort of passes the eye test. If you remember my Chile-Norway example, Chile has actually higher source frictions than Norway. It turns out all the different measures, price dispersion, incoming, outgoing. And this seem to correlate fairly well. The rest of the parameters um, are, some of them are more straightforward. So the final step is to use prices, ballast choices, and trade flows to get travel costs, freight valuations, and entry costs. And uh, the outline of how this is done is that to get the ship costs, we basically do rust, okay? just the way we discussed it. We solve the fixed point of these value functions. We use the observed ballast choices to get the costs. For valuations, we go to prices. And I'm going to show you this, so don't worry about it. And for the production and export costs, it's a pure discrete choice, because this is the simple model that you choose your exporting destination. 
So this is going to look a lot like a Berry inversion. So these two parts are fairly standard. This one is a bit less, so I'm going to give you a quick um, overview. So this is the Rust part. We basically use the ship choices to get the travel costs. We just do maximum likelihood. And just like we saw this morning, basically the choice probabilities are logic-like. So this is the probability of staying at port, probability of traveling. So for example, the probability that you choose to ballast from I to J what, what do you get? You get the value of a traveler, which means that you pay your travel cost and you arrive later and restart there over the denominator. And I am essentially going to solve for the value functions via a fixed point. It's a contraction map. Plug this in a likelihood and get the parameter, uh, the cost parameters, just like Rust. For the prices, I am basically going to go to my price equation that we saw from the model. And if you look at this for a second, you will see that it is entirely straightforward to get the valuations. Okay? So this is data. This part, once I know the costs, is computable. So I know it. And everything that's in these ratios, almost everything is actually known. So lambda I know from the matching function, delta beta I'm going to calibrate. And so essentially for every price that I see, I can back out the valuation of the exporter that signed this contract. So, I have the PIS and I'm doing an inversion for the Ws. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Just in case I slip by somebody else other than me. <laughs> so, this is pure, this is just Rust using the observed prices. I don't really need to know the equilibrium prices to do this. Does that make sense? OK. Um, and that's more or less that in terms of the parameters that I want to estimate. Um, these are the, the estimated valuations for exporters. And this is fairly reasonable in the sense that Brazil is the highest value exporter. Brazil exports very high quality minerals um, and grain, which is the most expensive good. Indonesia exports very low quality coal, and it's one of the lowest valuation exporters out there. We have one graph that sort of tries to make this argument more rigorously. So we're correlating here the percent of your exports in grain, which is the highest value frequently shipped good. And you see that basically it correlates fairly well with the estimated valuations. OK, so I have 10 minutes, and I really want to show you the types of counterfactuals that, that you can do with this model. So I want to go through these four. Um, the first one is going to be an improvement in shipping efficiency. So what does this mean? This means what ha it's a trade elasticity. And it's basically asking, what will happen if we are going to decrease sailing costs, let's say, by 10%? Okay? So what's going to happen here? CS, think of this like the production cost of the transport sector. Okay? So when CS is going to go down, mechanically, sort of the direct effect is that prices are going to go down, simply because marginal cost falls, price is going to fall. So price is going to fall, exports are going to increase, and that's what you see. Basically, everywhere in the world, exports go up. Okay? Of course, th this is not the only thing that happens, because otherwise it would be fairly trivial. The extra thing, the sort of indirect effect that is going to happen here, is that the ships are going to react to this change. Okay? So what's going to happen? When this CS parameter goes down, which is the sailing cost, all of a sudden, it is cheaper for ships to ballast. Okay? And basically, ships are better off everywhere in the world. So take a ship that ends a trip in China. All of a sudden, the ship says, I'm not going to wait here. It's very cheap for me to go back to Australia. I'm going to leave. My outside option is higher. You're going to have to pay me more to hire me in China. Okay? So essentially, CS falls, prices fall, but this f decrease is dampened by the fact that the outside option of ships is higher. And so prices don't fall as much as they would have if ships were not able to respond to this change. Okay? Now, the final thing, so there is the dampening. And then the final interesting thing that happens is that this dampening creates interesting geographical variation. And in particular, if you look at the graph, you will see that the countries that actually gain the most 
are the big high value exporters. So Brazil, North America, Australia, Indonesia are the countries that gain the most. Why? Because all of a sudden, ships are happier, they will ballast, it's cheap to ballast, they will go wherever they want. Where will they go? They will go to the big high value exporters. So essentially this dampening effect, this ship behavior leads to a form of polarization that says exporters will gain even more and importers uh, will lose disproportionately. Okay? So this suggests that the trade elasticities we're estimating um, uh, should essentially be dampened by the transport sector. So you decrease the travel cost, prices fall, exporting rises, but at the same time the ship's outside option increases because the ballasting is, is cheaper and this pushes prices up and exporting down and it does so in a polarizing way. Okay? The second counterfactual is Chinese slowdown. Okay? And I think this nicely illustrates um, proximity effects and it's going to show basically how geography and your neighbors and your region really matter for, for the trade that you're able to make. And I was hoping I would add some new graphs where we're looking at how the centrality of a region matters for this, but we're going to stick to that. So let me start with China. So China slows down, which means that its imports are going to fall. And what you see is that in a, its imports fall and its exports fall at the same time. Why? It's the import-export complementarity I mentioned in the beginning. All these ships were ending their trip in China. They were stuck here. China wasn't really exporting much. And because they were stuck here, they were cheap to hire. So if you were <coughs> a Chinese exporter, you were happy because prices were very low because the ships were stuck there. These ships no longer arrive there. You need to sort of pay them more to come. Prices go up and exports are going to go down as well. Okay? So that's the first step. The second step is to look at China's neighbors. And this is a very interesting pocket of the world, and this is what I mean by the proximity, <coughs> because it's a, comp it's a region that has a combination of importers and exporters. So you have Australia, Indonesia, who are big exporters, and then you have India, China, Japan, who are big importers. So what happens here? China shrinks, it imports less, and as you can see, trade goes down in all of these regions. Why? Direct effect. So all of these countries are exporting a lot to China. Think of Australia. Even India, whatever it exports, it exports to China. Okay? So they lose a trading partner, exports go down. Okay? But again, that's not all. all right? So because this is a region that on average was balanced, ships were very happy to stay in this region and basically do short trips between these different countries. Go, to, go from Australia to China, from China to Indonesia, and Indonesia back to China, and so on. And when China shrinks, part of this fleet that was sitting here is going to reallocate. And so these countries are going to lose even more because this cheap sort of supply of ships is going to be reduced. Okay? What happens to the rest of the world? So first of all, direct effect, trade will just go down. Take Australia. Australia was exporting a lot to China. Once it loses China, trade goes down. <coughs> but you can see that the left is much more uh, less, uh, the, the, the sort of left is very different from the right. Okay, so here you have much bigger declines than here. And the reason is that the ships that left this area, where are they going to go? They're going to go to places like Brazil. And so Brazil is actually going to start exporting to Europe and to North America. And so it's going to lose less than it would have were ships not able to, to react to this change. Yeah. Yes. So they, they, everybody else gets hurt more than China? That's right. Because all these countries export to China, right? I mean, China's imports are falling. Its exports, in fact, I, I'm not surprised by that. But even Europe gets hurt more than China. Well, yeah. So this is Chinese imports being reduced, and this affects Chinese exports. In contrast, Australia, a huge part of Australian production goes to China. So of course it's going to be hurt. Of course Australian exports are going to be hurt a lot more than Chinese exports. I mean, the only channel through which exports are hurt in China is our channel, basically. So yeah. let me put it this way. 
Um, okay, so import export complementarities in the neighboring countries, you have the effect of losing the ship supply in the region. In distant countries, you have the same direct effect, but you have the benefit of an increased supply in these regions. Northwest Passage, so Northwest Passage is a, uh, is a route in the Arctic. It would basically be bring the east coast of North America closer to the Far East. It's not navigable because of ice, but there is uh, policy discussion to actually open it up so that it becomes navigable to ships. Um, what's going to happen if you were to do that? So let me first look at the countries that are affected and then the countries that are not directly affected. So no surprises here, exports in the US are going to go up. All of a sudden, it's closer to one of its bigger customers. <coughs> this is interesting. China goes down. Chinese exports go down. You might have thought import-export complementarity, so they should go up. And the this complementarity is there, but there is an effect that is stronger. And this effect is the ship outside option. So take a ship in China. This ship now is basically better off than it was before. Because from China, the ship is going to ballast probably. It's not going to wait. Before it could go here. Now it has another option, which is to go and come here. So it has one more option. Its outside option is higher. Prices are going to be pushed up. Exports are going to fall in China. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, the other option? I'm sorry, this is, a, this is an artifact of the way regions are defined. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, because we only use 15 regions, basically. Um, what happens to the rest of the world? So first of all, something happens, right? Um, and you see that essentially exports go down everywhere. Why? Outside options. So ships are better off. This local effect actually becomes global through the outside option and this network of uh, this set of value functions. And now this is going to push prices up and exports down. Interestingly, which are the regions that are hurt the most? Brazil and the west coast of North America. Why? Because ships used to ballast to Brazil and now they will choose to go here. Same thing for North America. In contrast, Australia is going to lose a lot less because it's protected by being very close to China itself. Okay. Um, so this was just showcasing how a local shock becomes global. Uh, the last thing, and I'm going to stop, is what happens if you don't have frictions, surge frictions. Um, no surprises here. Trade is going to increase. Um, the only interesting thing to note is that you have the same polarization effect. So once you remove frictions, uh, ships are going to choose where they go, and they will choose to go towards the high value exporters. So even though you lose a friction, you actually end up getting uh, a sort of widening of, of inequality by this measure. Okay. So these counterfactuals <coughs> are basically trying to showcase three mechanisms. The first is that whatever shock happens to the system, it affects the ship's outside option as well, and this has a direct impact on prices and exports. The second is that um, changes in transport costs really depend on the trading network and the ge geographical proximity to importers and exporters. And the last thing is that reductions in impediments to trade are disproportionately going to affect large high value uh, exporters leading to polarization. So these are sort of three um, messages from these experiments. And that's pretty much all I had to say. It's, it's basically a micro foundation of a portion of total trade costs um, trying to argue that it's quantitatively important to think about the endogeneity of the transport sector and trade people in their in sort of theory work are also starting to think about this sort of phenomena. And the unrelated somewhat point to this is that uh, search frictions can be important in this market. And I think there is sort of a lot of interesting policy questions um, that these sort of tools can be used to answer uh, in other transport sectors or as well. There is in the next two years, there's going to be at least three truck papers coming out and um, taxi papers and so on. And there's just a lot of interesting questions about policy and regulation that are coming up. So that's all I had to say. Thank you.